Living Christ in a changing world has always been a balance of staying firm in truth and flexible in application. Welcome to Word for the Week Season 2, Episode 23, where we discuss Finding the Line, Adaptability versus Pliability. So, how did we end up with this doozy of a week's focus? <laughs> well, we're splitting some pretty uh, fine uh, verbal hairs this week, but I, I think that we'll find out by you know the time we're done, it's worth it. And it started with um, really anticipating our last speaker coming in uh, for this series we're on. And uh, she and her husband are a Korean-American couple uh, who are missionaries in the Chinese culture of Taiwan. So there they are uh, essentially navigating three different cultures with large differences and subtle differences. Uh, and sometimes it's the subtle differences that complicate things a whole bunch. <laughs> uh, yeah, they can be the, the hardest thing there. Yeah. So uh, the point being, then this word came in, these folks will have to be uh, or must be very flexible right. in their approach and how they bring their Christian message. Uh, and not that they are flexible in the Christian message, but in the way in which they uh, present it. So. Right. And people on the mission field have always had to be innovative in their approach. And mm -hmm. that's something we could all learn from. <laughs> yeah, innovation is, is something we need. And, and yeah. really, when I got thinking of what you said and uh, looking at these people coming in, it made me think of something the Apostle Paul wrote to the church in Corinth a long time ago, dealing with flexibility and change. Right. So let's set the stage by reading the passage that Paul wrote to the Corinthians. As delivered by St. Kathy. <laughs> The Apostle Paul's first letter to the church in Corinth, chapter 9. Though I am free and belong to no one, I have made myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. To the Jews I became like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law I became like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, so as to win those under the law. To those not having the law, I became like one not having the law. Though I am not free from God's law, but am under Christ's law, so as to win those not having the law. To the weak, I became weak, to win the weak. I have become all things to all people, so that by all possible means I might save some. I do all this for the sake of the gospel, that I may share in its blessings. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the game goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I don't run like someone running aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. No. I strike a blow to my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. It seems like Paul walks a really fine line between being adaptable and pliable. Mm -hmm. But we know he knows <laughs> what he's doing. Yeah. So what is he doing? <laughs> so what is he doing? Uh, and, and I don't think we can really identify what Paul's doing, that fine line that he's walking uh, in this whole flexibility thing until we really establish a few key words ourselves. And that's why it's called Word for the Week. That's <laughs> a, we like to define words. Right. And so let's see how those words pan out understanding we're doing it as it applies to uh, the Christian message and the Christian walk. Right. So. Okay. First word is flexibility. Flexibility. One, the ability to bend easily or without breaking. Mm -hmm. Two, the 
quality of being easily adapted or of offering many different options. Mm -hmm. And three, the ability and willingness to adjust one's thinking or behavior. Right. And and so there's flexibility in this general sense. Mm -hmm. But as we look at it, it, it's, it's a nice neutral definition we need flexibility in life, right. uh, uh, but then it becomes just how we become flexible. And the question might be, is flexibility mm. always a positive feature? Exactly. I mean, if we look at that definition, it mm-hmm. could be good or bad. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. So we're after the good definition. And uh, I think that uh, then we need to, uh, we had to pick words to, to kind of fit the concept. So we're going to look at the two words that we brought in here, looking for an explanation on, uh, well, starting with this one, adapt- adaptable. Yeah. Able to adjust oneself to new or changed circumstances. Able to adjust oneself to changing circumstances. And it, and I think it's implied here that we're talking about a positive adjustment to whatever those changes are. Right. And now we're dealing with this word in a very particular way. Yes. Uh, as a matter of fact, so particular we may have to um, have a sequel to this. But we're talking about adapting uh, uh, our ability to communicate a timeless and unchanging message. So, you know, a timeless message in a changing world, um, how do you adjust your approach to do that? Keeping in mind the gospel message is perfect and timeless, but we are not. Right. So, uh, you know, you add that, you've got a perfect message coming from imperfect uh, people. So uh, this really starts getting a bit of a sticky point. But the idea, as we look at the passage uh, that Paul wrote himself, you can imagine that Paul himself had to be very adaptable. Mm-hmm. Here's this this guy. He's going out. He's dealing with multiple cultures, mm-hmm. multiple reactions within each of those cultures. Mm-hmm. Uh, the message just doesn't change, but the way he he's communicating, he better be able to adapt, or uh, we wouldn't add a New Testament, really. <laughs> yeah, so, that's right. So the first of these uh, words we're talking about. As we defined, well, I guess we talked to da- Adapto. Let's move on to the next one. What does it mean to be a pliable person? Pliable. A pliable person is easily influenced and controlled by other people or circumstances. Okay. So, you know, here we, we get adaptable sounded like a positive side of flexibility. Pliable, uh, maybe not so much. Um, you adjust to new circumstances, but... Uh, you know, talking about the person themselves. So in the context, now we're talking about delivering this timeless and perfect message Mm -hmm. to a changing world and us being imperfect. So you, being our oracle of wisdom here on Word for the Week, how would you explain the difference of adaptable and pliable in this context? I guess adaptability would be a person remaining true to their core beliefs Mm -hmm. while navigating outside change, Mm -hmm. while pliability is facing outward change <clears throat> but allowing it to remake your core beliefs right 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 so so adaptability outside um, outside influences um, not changing your core belief maybe your approach but not your core beliefs pliability right. uh, being the case where uh, the stressors on you actually change your core beliefs mm-hmm. so um, uh, the whole thing uh, reminded me of a character in a book and mm-hmm. what is known as a Christian allegory. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, it, in fact, was a story. It's uh, it's considered... Which the, you might give that definition of allegory. Well, an allegory is an extended metaphor. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> in other words, uh, uh, well, I get into that a little bit as we kind go on. Kind of putting on. things into practical terms. That, uh, yeah, that that are kind of um, abstract, mm-hmm. uh, kind of like me. But <laughs> the man's name was John Bunyan. He wrote a book that is still to this day considered the um, the the greatest fictional theological fiction is what they called it, uh, a, a fictional story. The greatest work in this genre, in all of time, mm. well, all of Christian history, yeah. Yeah. Um, and so 
Uh, you t I think you've read this book, too. It's mm -hmm. entitled The Pilgrim's Progress. Right. It was very, at the very beginning of my Christian faith. And it, what it did was it launched me into a whole bunch of other books um, that helped me apply, mm -hmm. you know, my Christian faith to my world, <laughs> yeah. you know, mm -hmm. what I was facing and everything. And, yeah. um, but, you know, it's neat. Like you said, even after 400 years, it's, it's still, still Pilgrim's work. Progress is still considered one of the greatest Christian works. Yeah. Well, I found that interesting. You said that the book itself, like, uh, for me, the book itself was a big impact for you. The impact was it, it sent you on to other readings. Well, uh, I had never come across anything quite like that yeah you know mm -hmm. and i i always did love kind of fantasy journey kind of, yeah yeah and of course the pilgrim's progress right. is written in that way i think the same thing for me when i read it was hey what's going to happen next and i'm not the most brilliant person so oh so me you put, said well but i mean all these other books like um what was the one i had mentioned uh, uh, what would jesus, jesus do did. yeah which like, was a book yeah. yeah and just just different ones that really spoke to me where I was yeah, at young the in time. my faith and you know yeah it, it really is because it was kind of if you haven't read it anybody you, yeah, you, you want to go and read it well and you, <laughs> you were you were kind of pinning me down on what exactly is an allegory and I gave the uh, quippy answer of extended metaphor but basically what that means is that you take something like a personality like the characters in this book uh, the characters are uh, some some trait like there's right. there's a, a guy and his name is obstinate and you know right. him as the the character obstinate. Right. There's another fellow and this is how it tied in. His name is pliable, <laughs> and he's only referred to under his name pliable. Right. Uh, there's a story in this journey where there's a man named Christian, mm -hmm. and so you get that he's leaving the worldly values that we tend to hold, and. Um, uh, of course, he's leaving a place called the City of Destruction, going to the Celestial City. Right. So that that's how uh, extended metaphor works. Mm -hmm. So we're not going into the entire book, but what we are interested in is just how these two characters in particular, obstinate and pliable, um, uh, actually work out. And the best way, I actually went to an official summary of the book and thought, and pulled out parts and thought I'd have yeah. you uh, give us a little bit of that summary. Sure. The summary goes, Christian fled from the city of destruction after coming under conviction for his sins. He met Evangelist, who pointed across a wide mm. field to a wicked gate and to the light. And that That's is wi wicked. <laughs> yeah, wicked. Yeah, not, not wicked. wicked. Yeah, Sorry. Right. To, it's my accent anyway. <laughs> Two neighbors were determined to bring him back by force, and they were Mr. Obstinate and Mr. Pliable. All right. Bunyan, Bunyan's character, Obstinate, mm -hmm. he pursued Christian in order to persuade him to come back to the city of destruction with them. He rejected Christian's invitation to come with him to the celestial city, refusing to abandon his friends and comforts. He cannot grasp that there could be anything important enough for Christian to leave everything behind. Obstinate refuses to use sound principles of argument in order to persuade Christian to return. Bunyan's character, Pliable, who actually does travel some of the journey with Christian, the first thing we notice is that Pliable has no burden on his back. He probably had some slight superficial conviction. He longs only for the benefits of the kingdom and doesn't count the cost. He has no sense of sin, no knowledge of his own heart, no desire after Christ, no feeling of his need of a Savior. And the great thing about this is uh, why I put had it in here is that as we look at the word pliable, there is a personification of what it means to be pliable in the Christian walk. Right. So it fits in really well. And we can see how the two characters work, obstinate is somebody who is uh, the opposite of flexible. They are simply uh, hostile. Mm -hmm. And and that can work on either side. I, I'm sure we've met obstinate people who are trying to be Christian, mm -hmm. and it's very abrasive. Yeah. And then you have the obstinate who, who are, are against it. Pliable, on the other hand, is a person you might be initially attracted to. Uh, outwardly, they're agreeable. Yeah. 
it doesn't come along later, you realize maybe there's not a whole lot of roots to those convictions. Mm -hmm. And if we go by this classic work by uh, John Bunyan, neither one of them fare very well in the story. So, right. Uh, one impression I'm getting from our discussion so far mm -hmm. is that there's a tension, mm -hmm. even a fine line maybe between being adaptable and just pliable. Right. I guess the way that I would put it for the Christian yeah. is either you will change the world or the world will change you. Yeah, yeah, that is really, uh, and, and you know, there's nothing like Facebook for this because I've watched Christians we've known over time, what they they tend to put in these little snapshots and yeah. uh, and there's people I've reading and that, no, that sounds like they're still on the on the journey of trying to change the world while others is, man, the world has changed you. Yeah. Uh, and of course, we're coming back to that changed in in your core beliefs and not in not in a positive way. Right. Um, to illustrate the extremes, because this is it, we can't blame anyone for for where they end up in things, whether they become pliable or adaptable, because the world is changing so rapidly. <laughs> there, it's polarizing so yes. rapidly yes. that uh, we have this wide spectrum we have to navigate. And either we're adapting and holding our core beliefs mm -hmm. or we're pliable and changing our core beliefs so, you know, we can just get along, we can right. navigate. And I thought what would be interesting in this was uh, not for the sake of, of, of passing any judgment on anything, but showing two extremely uh, different points of view to the same stressors we're talking about. Yeah. And so from that point, and, and two articles, just highlights through them. We have them linked in the transcript if people want to read them in the full. But just to give us the idea of, of how wide, uh, you know, the, the, the disparity can be in the culture we're trying to navigate. Right. Okay, our first article is... I know, it does that to me too. Just... <laughs> Four reasons the Christian rights claim of moral superiority are so absurd. It was written by Valerie Tarico in 2015, and it's leaked, like Pastor said in our transcript, mm -hmm. but we'll only be hitting a few highlights to illustrate the idea. Mm -hmm. Okay, here we go. Evangelicals are constantly bellowing about America's moral decay. Mm -hmm. They yes, could they stand to take a look in the mirror. Mm -hmm. Tired of being stigmatized and shunned, some atheists have set out to daylight the moral values they live by and why. Some are specifically reclaiming words like morality and spirituality, which have long been owned by the religious sector. Humanist chaplaincies like the Harvard Humanist Hub have been springing up on college campuses. Even the Satanic Temple has stepped into the public eye with a mission and a manifesto affirming broadly held humanistic values. As culture continues to evolve and moral consciousness deepens, the tribal, racist, sexist worldview of the Bible writers appears ever more cruel and morally stunted. Bible literalists who insist on treating ancient texts as if they were the literally perfect word of God and their own interpretation of these texts as if it were the only one possible end up coming across the same way. As their views become less appealing, young people motivated by an honest search for truth and compassion find the church less and less appealing. Right. And, uh, you know, bottom line is <clears throat> as an atheist finding a, a, a godless anchor in an ever-changing uh, society. So it's understandable where they go in this. Although uh, I said we're not casting any judgment on anything. It's just, her article is actually quite compelling if, if you step back and just read it. But... Mm. Uh, but I would also point this out. I said, you know, I think every, especially every Christian should um, have to take at least a, this ph philosophy course that the, we uh, picked up from the Greeks. Now, the Greeks were big in rhetoric, so they laid down um, objective rules on, okay, this is true and this is not true, uh, before they ever discussed a topic. So there were like rules of the game. Okay. Uh, and it's called systematic logic. And basically you have these rules. There's uh, around 17 of them we have now. And a lot of them we've given more English titles to. Uh, <clears throat> but they are rules that 
you can learn these rules and you can discern. You go down through any anybody's claim or stump speech and you can apply these and uh, and you find out no matter how appealing, how true it is or not true. Okay. Well, in this one, mm, I, I just did a brush through and I think I find it, vo it violated something like seven of 17 rules. So, oh, boy, so, uh, so it was pretty flawed. Yeah, yeah you know, I'm afraid mm -hmm. it, it was. Yeah, mm -hmm. so... And and add this too is that and it's not to 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 pick on this article in particular, but something a warning as we we go into this world of internet and you have uh, memes and quips that you read that reason uh, and logic are often the first casualties. Because just just reading that, I I saw several things that yeah I I could I could see that you yeah. know so. If you run with that without some level of discernment, right? Yeah, be, because it's raising legitimate problems, and from their standpoint, a legitimate approach. So logic becomes very, very important. So I, I have to ask: if this editorial is so flawed, then why include it? Because, like I said, the 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 lady has a legitimate point, and I think it comes up in her closing comment um, that I'll have you read. Okay. If they, that is professing, professing Christians, mm -hmm. find that Americans increasingly turn elsewhere for inspiration and moral values, maybe they should do a little soul searching instead of pointing the finger at atheists. Yep. And that's going to take us into that area of, um, mm -hmm. of pliability or adaptability. Right. You know, for, um, for all the fact, as we said about this, I think that comment is right on the mark. Uh, if yeah. if you took nothing else, uh, the, the the Christian Church should uh, take that into to consideration. Yeah. And I believe one of the key elements at the at the root of the problem, uh, even within the Christian Church, is that we end up mistaking trying to be relevant. We end up mistaking pliability for adaptability yeah. uh, in our approach. And to a larger degree, the Christian community is not changing the world. The world is changing it. And a changing culture demands flexibility. Mm -hmm. And, of course, we'll either adapt in our approach or become pliable in our core beliefs, like, you know. Like yeah. Saying, so. yeah, I mean, we really ended up with the three th obstinate, inflexible, Mm -hmm. or uh, adaptable or uh, pliable. You know, th yeah. those are the choices. Yeah. Um, so we're looking at the extremes. Here is, is one extreme, and, and I think it is good for Christian people to read um, uh, atheist lines of thinking with an open heart to, to yeah. see where they are. Not, yeah. uh, uh, but We it's, can stay in our own little world <laughs> yeah. without looking out too much and... That can be, yeah, and, an eye opener. With me. It can, and there's uh, there's qualifying qualifiers to that, which we'll hit before the end. But right. so here is one side. If we're talking about a culture that, even with the even from the atheist standpoint, that they see that um, um, it, it's a question of morals and spirituality and all of these things. Mm -hmm. So that's one approach to the stressors in the culture now. I thought I'd offer something I thought was fascinating, which is an opposite approach to what this is. And it's a burgeoning movement that merges medieval Christian practices with the uh, digital practices in the world today. Which I must read slowly. <clears throat> uh, yeah, uh, we have to say these articles were written to read and not so uh, uh, yeah. not well, verbalized. Not to read out loud, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, the article's called Christianity Gets Weird. A few weeks ago, I dialed into the Eucharist for the first time, praying for spiritual communion as my priest consumed the host in front of the altar. The webcam was clear. The sound quality was top-notch. But the Mass was decidedly old school. In the absence of a choir, my church, the Episcopal Church of St. Ignatius of Antioch in New York City, had the organist sing the traditional Mass in Gregorian chant. Music dating back to the 11th century. I'd love to hear that. This was just one of many remote religious activities I've participated in recently. 
I've also, for example, gathered over Zoom with friends for a nighttime prayer with roots in the medieval mon monastic tradition, and I'm not alone. More and more young Christians, disillusioned by the political binaries, economic uncertainties, and spiritual emptiness that have come to define modern America, are finding solace in a decidedly anti-modern vision of faith. Many of us call ourselves weird Christians, albeit partly in jest. What we have in common is that we see a return to old school forms of worship as a way of escaping from the crisis of, oh, I always would say this wrong. Modernity. Modernity, thank you. And the liberal capitalist faith in individualism. Weird Christianity is equal parts traditionalism and, well, punk. Christianity as a transgressive, transgressive alternative to contemporary secular capitalist culture. Oh boy, this guy thought it, huh? Like punk, weird Christianity has its own clearly defined aesthetic. The ranks of self-described weird Christians are small and largely limited, limited to the internet, but evidence suggests that there may be more interest in the aesthetics of traditionalist Christianity than you might think. Modern America's loose approach to spirituality is what attracts many weird Christians <coughs> to a more demanding conception of faith. At the same time, however, it's precisely the techno technological innovations of modern American culture, including that zenith of spirituality, Twitter, that make finding their spiritual tribe possible. Like the hipster obsession with authenticity that marked the mid-2010s, the rise of weird Christianity reflects America's unfulfilled desire for, well, something real. Well, and, and you know, isn't that a beautiful line to end on? Yeah. It, it's, <clears throat> it really encapsulates the thing from the atheist as well. Both of them are looking for something real. Right. Uh, one moves forward forward, uh, if you will, in a way, in abandoning God to human reasoning. The other actually goes back to uh, almost more of a mystical medieval approach. Uh, one uh, uh, throws off the shekels of conformity or uh, discipline, I would say, yeah. while the other one says it's discipline and demand that we actually need. Yeah. So, you know, you end up with this thing. So, uh, really leads to the question then with all the stressors going on, will that thirst for something real be satisfied by a Christian community that decides to be adaptable or merely pliable? Maybe this will help with that question. Let me mention this one last article, The Power of Flexibility by Marjorie Eddington. At one point she used the analogy of the Christian faith walk being like trees in a storm. If they have no flexibility, they'll break. But if they're too flexible, they probably won't survive the storm either. Yeah, it's it was a thought-provoking little article that, once again, one that's um, linked into in our transcript. But I won't outright steal her analogy, but I will borrow from it. Uh, simply because it really resonates with anyone who's a hiker in the Midwest. And, uh, and let me start by asking you this question as a person in the Midwest yourself. Here we are, uh, we go out into the woods after one of our epic wind rainstorms. What do you tend to see? I don't even have to look at go hiking. You yeah. just have to look outside in <laughs> our yard. The, in the we driveway. Have trees, branches everywhere. Every time we have a storm, we have to clean the driveway before we can drive out of the garage so mm -hmm. yeah there's usually a number of trees that have fallen over hole and way down to the roots and then some are just you know branches that have come off the trees it's come yeah. off the trees uh, so you know we we have the whole enchilada but it is interesting to to go out into the woods and see an entire tree uh nothing broken on it just gave way at the roots right. <laughs> and it's laying on the ground so how i i borrow from her analogy especially with the church and people's core beliefs is like this. The brittle branches uh, that are totally inflexible, well, yeah, they, they, the winds have changed. They just break in them. You know, they just break. The fallen trees, the ones that are lying over their hole down to the roots are the pliable. Uh, they just weren't able to, to stand for what they stand for. They didn't have the roots. And then, of course, the trees that survive, those that flexed, 
uh, they are, uh, but didn't fall. They're the adaptable ones being able, uh, and this is kind of what brought me to the, the, where the analogy struck me is that being able to flex and yet not fall over demands something. And it demands that you have deeper roots. You mm-hmm. can flex all you want as long as you've got the deep roots. Yeah. And of course, when we're talking about the Christian hope, the Christian message, those roots are uh, roots of understanding and commitment. But if you're going to flex, you better have the roots. So. Right. So flexibility is necessary, but it doesn't work without those deep roots. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Bend, bend, but have the roots. Uh, mm-hmm. That's exactly it. Need flexibility. So in this particular context of this episode, we are talking about dealing with the Christian message itself. So in approachability uh, versus how it cha- we we change it. So when it comes to the gospel message, pliability bad, <laughs> adaptability good. <laughs> well, that's absolutely true when we're talking about the gospel message. But there is a time that the reverse is true. Uh, but yes, we'll talk about that next week. Yes, and the people will be on the edge of their seats for that. <laughs> cliffhanger. I know I am. I can't wait to to talk about the reversal of this. Uh, But uh, so that's the idea. That's what we wanted to get across. There is a concept of pliability and flexibility. One, the world changes you and the other, you change the world. Mm -hmm. So very, very important. And that just naturally takes us into our song, right? (laughs) We take you out of this episode with the worship song, always co-written by Chris Tomlin. In speaking about the song, he said, I've always tried to write songs that give people a voice to worship God. And my prayer is that when people hear this song, their faith is strengthened and they're reminded of the steadfast and unchanging hope we have in God. And you know what? There's Chris Talman talking about he's adaptable and <laughs> by right. his musical approach, but the message is unchanging. He That's is not right. pliable. Mm-hmm. May you be reminded of our unchanging hope in God. And until next week, be blessed. Be blessed. Sunday morning, so many mornings, it's, it seems like a routine, but just think, you're going to get to sing to the creator of the universe. A lot of the world doesn't even know who that is. And we have that privilege. So why don't we sing this morning like it is a privilege? I believe you gave sight to the blind. I believe that the dead came to life. I believe there were wonders and signs And you're still the same I believe every word that you said I believe there are skies in your hands That your goodness is good without end And you'll never change I will tell of your wonders Sing of your grace, the God of creation knows me by name. The Lord is faithful, yesterday, now, and always, always. Your mercy is mighty, age after age, and all generations bow down and praise. The Lord is faithful, yesterday, now, and always. Always, I believe you will come in the clouds. I believe you are here even now. In your presence, I know there is power, power to save. I will tell of your wonder, sing of your grace, the God of creation knows me by name. The Lord is faithful yesterday, now, and always, always. Your mercy is mighty, age after age, and all generations bow down and praise. The Lord is faithful yesterday.
org. You can also catch our live stream on Canaan Community's Facebook, YouTube, or your favorite podcast app.